Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Total Biscuit. I'm here to ask and answer one simple question. WTF is Renowned Explorers International Society. It is a roguelite strategy game, turn-based. A little bit of exploration tossed in there for good measure. And it's from Abbey Games. They're the folks behind Reyes, which was a fairly slow-paced, but very nicely designed god game with a really cool aesthetic to it. Renowned Explorer shares a similarly cool aesthetic, but mechanically and certainly in terms of pacing, I think is a hell of a lot more competent and a much, much more well put together title. Let's have a look at settings before we begin. So first things first, I would actually turn this off. I found that this was causing frame rate drops and stalling when metrics was enabled. So I turned that off. We're going to, I think, turn this off as well for the purpose of this demonstration. So you can turn the cinematic combat animations off, which speeds combat up a great deal. And I would suggest that after a first few playthroughs, but for the purpose of this demonstration, I would like to show you them because they're really quite nice and would be a bit of a shame to miss out on those. Otherwise, kind of standard options here. You can skip through story text entirely if you want to blitz through stuff, which is great if you've played a lot. Windowed mode, full screen, and borderless available. All the resolutions I imagine you could want, including 640x480, which is a bit ridiculous. V-Sync on or off, environmental particle effects, and terrain texture, low, medium, and high. Bear in mind, this is a 2D game, so you're not really expecting too many fancy display options. And then master volume, music, and sound volume available as well. There is no voice acting in the game, so you don't need to worry about a slide of a voice. All right, that's the options menu. Nice and easy. So what is this? Well... Let me take you through at least the start of a game, and that should give you a pretty good feel. Click on New Game here, and it allows you to choose between Discovery and Adventure Mode. Adventure Mode is basically Iron Man. That means that someone dies, if you lose, it's game over, basically. It's game over. Now, you can't lose members of your party permanently. If you lose your whole party, you lose the game under Adventure Mode, but you can revive people in battle. Discovery Mode allows you to move a little bit faster, you maybe get a few more resources, and it re lets you retry and save and load whenever you like. So, we'll stick with Discovery for the purpose of the demonstration, because I'm a big wimp. You've also got Cheat Mode here, which lets you skip battles entirely. So, if you are looking, I think, to do quick unlocks, this is a good way to do it. I'm pretty sure you can do unlocks this way or test out new builds and all that sort of thing. Difficulty levels, you've got easy, normal, classic, and impossible. Classic, I've, I haven't beaten yet. I've beaten normal several times, probably six or seven. Normal is, is pretty forgiving, as they say. Play it under adventure mode for a little bit more of a challenge. But we'll play this one on classic to just try and show you a little bit of the depth of the combat here, rather than just spamming your way through it. All right. So, you have the ability to choose a team of three brave explorers. Now, the captain that you have access to is dependent on how many games you've played. So, you've got to do various little things in order to unlock these characters as captains. Each captain has a unique buff. So, if I pick Anna as my captain, she has Brilliant Scientist. Completing a research paper will give you a study token. or will give a study token a random improvement. You'll know what that means when you get into the game. Or I could pick Agatha. She gets plus one insight after every expedition, and she also gains extra study when she uses insight in these locations on the world map. Again, you probably don't know what any of this means. I'll explain it as you go. Each of these characters is focused on a number of different things. So Agatha, for instance, she's a scientist with great speech and speech defense, but lacks attack power. So she's got various abilities that involve speech buffs and also terrifying opponents. And she is best in a party that is either devious or friendly. So there are three main attitudes in this game. Friendly, devious, and aggressive. And this system is really quite in-depth, and I'll show you once we get into combat. So let's uh, choose who our captain is going to be here. We could start with... Well, let's just go with Victor for the time being. 50% gold? from an encounter token. So, if he fights, if he wins a fight, he gets a bunch of extra gold. Now, for crew members, you have access to everybody. So you've got four categories here. Scientist, Scouts, Fighters, and Speakers. So, with this crew, they recommend you go with someone either aggressive or friendly. So, we could maybe go with a friendly setup, because I think maybe the, the friendly aspect of the game is the most interesting aspect of it. Okay, so who do we go with? It recommends that we go with Philippe or Kwame. Okay. Kwame is this guy right here. So he is a speaker. Lacks attack power. Best in a friendly crew. 
Victor has high armor and is a balanced fighter, so he's a pretty good fighter. We we'll like that. Can we find a sort of friendly fighter or something like that? We could give it a look. Not Ivan, apparently. No, Ivan doesn't really fit in with that. I mean, there's nothing stopping you from taking pretty much anybody, but it's generally best to find some crew that have a bit of synergy with each other, so none of the fighters really fall into that. What about the scouts? Can we get an aggressive or friendly scout? Hmm, who's Molly Jones? High attack, decent armor. Great for an aggressive crew, but needs someone who can take some speech hits. Oh, we could go with her, certainly. Alternatively, we can have a look at Anna, who we talked to talked about earlier. That would that would work. So you can really pick whoever you want, but you probably want to look for some synergy. And it really depends on the kind of playstyle that you choose to take, and that might actually change during the game, dependent on a number of different factors. Okay, let's start our our adventure, our wonderful exploration. So that's our little team. And this is what you're going to be playing through the adventure with. Now, it is a bit of a roguelite, so you're going to be progressing as you would in a roguelite game. And things are actually quite short. The game can be beaten probably in about an hour to an hour and a half. And the game is designed around multiple playthroughs. So it's very FTL-esque. Yeah, that's maybe the best first comparison I can make. And you're about to see why. So let us adventure! So the tutorial island is about finding this uh, Viking ship. So we know exactly where it is to begin with. And we have a number of supplies. Now, every time we move a location from here, it will use a supply. That's very much like fuel in FTL. Each of these locations has different things that happen. If I head here, there will be an encounter, most likely, but I can also find gold. If I head here, there is going to be an ability to gain status, and status is the fame of your explorer group. The whole point is to become the most famous explorer group in the world. There is also the ability to upgrade my crew. And there's a wits challenge. Now, challenges take a variety of different forms, and they are based on the skills that you have. Do I have a tactician, a beguiler, or a quick thinker? I do have a tactician, as it turns out, so maybe it's best to go there. So let's move on. So that takes a supply. And we arrive at an open theater where some villagers are going to perform a piece about the Vikings. The director actually offers to allow us to play the part. So what we have here is a chance to succeed. So Kwame has the best chance to succeed at 59%. Obviously, if he fails, it's probably going to suck, but let's roll the dice. There's quite a lot of dice rolling in this game, and you're going to get this nice little stylish wheel, and we failed. Great. So we're probably going to piss off the villagers. Yep, shameful display, and we didn't gain anything from that. So all of these challenges are really based on the skills that you have in your party, and as you upgrade those and get various buffs, you will gain a higher chance of success. So if it's a physical challenge, you've got a bunch of guys that are really not physical at all, you probably don't want to move there, and you of course have the chance of completely and totally avoiding that if you so desire. Let's head over here to gain some quick status, absolutely, let's do that. So we compliment their campaign efforts and we tell them about our search for the longship and we gain these tokens. So there are various kinds of tokens in the game and they are traded in at the end of each expedition for resources. So campaign tokens will right now give me 10 to 15 status each and give you a small amount of renown. That's your overall score that determines whether or not you are the most famous explorers at the end and puts you on the leaderboards. Now these tokens can be buffed in various ways. So once you gather items or abilities or traits or some Something along those lines or followers that will give you bonuses based on this it might change your priority to start with you probably just want to be collecting everything you can but later on in the game you might want to focus on campaign tokens you might want to focus on challenge tokens or research tokens or something like that because you gain the most benefit from it we get two more campaign tokens from here that's always good and these are going to give you resources to spend on the world map which i'll show you later we have a wits challenge here. We can give that another shot. We failed the first one, but maybe we can do a better job here. Shameless promotion. Okay, not great chances to actually succeed here. But we'll roll the dice anyway. Why not? It's just for demonstration. Most of the time it's worth not doing this, but we got lucky. And we're going to be able to succeed with this challenge, which is great. And that means I get a bunch of campaign tokens. So that's good. That means I'm going to get a lot of status at the end of this mission. Now, you'll see my supplies are getting lower. Once my supplies run out, I can keep moving, but I'll gain a debuff every time I do it. However, if I move here, I might be able to get some resources. So let's do that. It's an abandoned farm with some supplies. Great. So I'm going to head over here. Don't want to head here. There's no point. There's nothing there. Engage the sheep. Okay, combat with the sheep, ladies and gentlemen. Here we go. So this is the combat screen, and this is where a lot of the meat of the game comes from. You might notice here that if I defeat my enemies in a friendly manner, I will actually gain a bonus, an encounter token, a bonus encounter token. If you beat a challenge, it usually gives you two encounter tokens, but if I beat it in a friendly manner, I can get three. 
And there's a number of different things that determine what happens there. It depends on what encounter it is, who the people are, your buffs and attitudes and all that sort of thing. And you can customize your party as you go through the game to provide you with different bonuses dependent on what kind of attitude you use. Okay, so this is where the real meat of the game is, and this is maybe where the genius of the game is as well. So at first glance, this looks like a fairly simple, tactical, turn-based battle game. It is, but there are quite a few interesting themes. So, to start with, moods. Moods are a big deal. So, in every encounter, you have a mood. Now, if you notice here, you've got a little bit of a rock-paper-scissors system. So, currently, the attitude of my opponents is friendly. However, I can change that, if I wish, by forcing them into different moods, and I can also change and gain advantage based on whatever my mood is. So if I attack aggressively here, I will actually change the mood. So I might want to do that initially, and then we'll try for a friendly victory after that. So I'm going to move it, move my fellow in here. Probably a mistake, because he's not much of a tank, but hey, they're sheep. They can't be that dangerous. And I'm going to hit him. Simple as that. And I missed, because I'm a moron. But I do get the aggressive mood here. So that means that I get brutal, plus 20 speech defense. So I actually have the advantage here if I stick with this attitude. However, my attitude can change depending on what I do. So, let's say I want to be a bit more friendly to the sheep. Why would you want to kill sheep? That would be mean. So, let's talk to the sheep. Let's uh, let's have some words. We're going to try to excite the sheep. Not in that way. Aha! The sheep is now excited. So, that is a friendly move. So, if I continue to do friendly moves, it's going to change the attitude to friendly. You notice these bars over here? They're going to tell you what your finishing attitude will be. So right now, it's super aggressive because I opened aggressively, but I can maybe change it to friendly. And right now, I'm still gaining this bonus at the moment versus the sheep. So let's move in again, and we have the ability to encourage the sheep. So let's encourage the sheep. There we go. We're going to convince the sheep that everything is awesome. Here you go. And the sheep is now very, very happy, is confident that my cause is the best, and runs off. Yep. So the health bar system in this game is called Spirit. You can break Spirit using a wide variety of different techniques. You can beat the crap out of them in the most simple manner imaginable. Or you can try and impress them. You can scare them away. You can make them so sad they don't want to fight anymore. But they all effectively work in the same way. You're reducing somebody's health bar. And of course you can also heal your teammates using these positive abilities. But you'll also notice of course that these moods are changing. So. I'm starting to get a little bit pleased, a little bit positive here. So if the sheep continues to use positive abilities on me, I may become excited. Now, excited is pretty good. If I become excited, I gain plus 25% speech. However, there are some positive things which can be debuffed. So if I, not, not in this case, but if I had a, a character that could impress, for instance, if you impress somebody, they become weak to speech attacks, which makes perfect sense. All right, let's try and take the sheep out. There we go. Very friendly. The sheep is excited and stops resisting. <laughs> Comical, isn't it? And that's changed the mood. Everybody's nice now. Physical attacks now have 50% attack power. So what you can do is you can shift the moods and the overall vibe of the battle in order to gain some bonuses. So if I want to use a physical attack right now, I'm going to gain a huge amount of attack power from it. You can see it right here, the amount of damage that I would do with that. So we're going to stab him because we gain a bonus. Aha! And the sheep is now instantly dead. I have now changed the attitude back to aggressive, which means I will not be able to gain that bonus. So that's the thing you've got to watch out for. You can take advantages, but you can lose out on bonuses. So it's all about manipulating the attitudes and the moods of your opponents, as well as your particular attitudes and moods to gain the biggest advantage, but also gain the biggest reward at the end of it. So I'm going to finish this, and I'm going to finish it most likely aggressively, as you can see here. We finished it aggressively. I have dominated the sheep. Not like that. And I gained two encounter tokens, and I also gained a buff for the rest of my expedition. Which means that he gets plus five armor and plus two attack power. Now, depending on what attitudes you use, <coughs> my apologies, you will gain different buffs. So, it really comes down to deciding how you want to encounter things. And of course, there are various monsters that respond differently to different things. Some are immune to certain abilities, some are immune to certain moods, some are vulnerable to certain moods. And they often put them in conflict, so they'll give you a bonus for defeating it the hard way. Which is interesting, and you've got to risk manage that way. Cool, we've got to level up. So, I, you always have a choice, one or the other. I can either upgrade his Diplomat, so he already has Diplomat level 2. The more levels I get in this, the more buffs I get, and you can also unlock some stuff. 
some special merchants and rulers and options and things like that. Alternatively, I can open up a new skill tree for him, which is Quick Thinker Alert. I'm going to go for Diplomat here. And when I pick this, it's also going to unlock him a new skill, which is Cheer. Again, another positive skill. That's a two-range attack. And I can excite people with it, and it heals an ally and makes them more positive. So there we go. We have Cheer now, which has range, whereas Excite did not. So that's pretty cool. All right, where else can we go? We've got four supplies left, so I think we can explore a couple more different things before we have to go and take on this encounter. And once we beat that encounter, I can show you the world map. So we can set up camp here, and we gain a couple of tokens. And I can also choose who will tell the campfire story. Kwame will tell it. There we go. Kwame is now the group's storyteller, and that actually becomes relevant later on in the game. Ah. Let's try and decipher this. Looks like we're going to have to deal with these. We can ignore and avoid them, or we can try and fight them. So, in some cases, you can avoid challenges. I'm going to fight them. I'm feeling good about myself. There we go. Fighting gets me challenge tokens. Let's give it a shot. And they don't seem all that dangerous. Okay, so beating this encounter in a devious way gets me a bonus. I don't really have all that many devious abilities, though. So, might not do that. But let's have a look and see... Yeah, these guys are easy to influence with speech, and they'll do kind of similar thing to you. Okay, well, if we open friendly, we actually get a bonus. So, we're going to go do that. Let's use our friendly attitude here. And that means I'm going to get a buff. I am now persuasive. I get plus 30 speech defense, which is going to be pretty good. I have my new ability here, cheer. Which, as it turns out, I don't have a target for. Oh, is it only... I can't use it in melee range, maybe? Okay, well, it's okay. We can use the other attitude. That'll be fine. Try and impress him, and we actually wiped him out immediately, which is great. And then we can try and do the same thing with this guy. This guy levels up and gets a AoE peace treaty, which is really useful. So if you want to be friendly, it's absolutely the way to go. Although there is a bit of a downside to his current positive ability, because as you can see, it can make people confident, which actually gives them a boost. So you want to watch out for that. The way that all of this interacts is really, really interesting. Love it. Obviously, it's a bit of a contrivance because everything you do is an attack in one way or the other because they really don't have a traditional health bar. They have a spirit bar, so they can be affected by literally anything. But it's still a really interesting contrivance because of how you have to interact with the systems. The fact that you can't just spam the same attack because you might end up with a disadvantage or you're maybe looking to finish a fight in a different way is really going to change and make you think about the different moves you use because you can set up situations for later down the road. Since you can start to build up moves with these little pips up here, if I want to switch over to Devious next turn to gain myself a bonus, I can do that. And I think there's a lot of advanced strategy to be found there. And that's particularly true in the higher difficulty levels. All right, let's see what we can get from this. We get a treasure, hopefully. That would be nice. Let's go and see what we get. And we get nothing. Okay. But if we head over there, we can get something. All right. We're going to burn out some supplies to try and get this treasure. Get some levels in the process. We can get the tactician or we can get diplomat. So let's uh, let's get diplomat, actually. Oh, hang on a minute. Let's check if anyone else is... Oh, he has diplomat. Let's not do that. That's pointless. No point. So let's get level three tactician. That gets me peace treaty. And I can get either engineer or naturalist. I'm going to engineer here because I'm pretty sure nobody else has that. And I get experimentation, which is an AOE attack. All right. So I'm going to start to burn some supplies here, which is going to give me debuffs, which will suck. But it might be worth it for the money. This treasure might be worth a lot. We get a small box, and what do we get? A Nordic bracelet, and it gives me a bonus. Six campaign tokens and two collects. So some of these treasures can give you a game-wide bonus for the entire duration. Some of it just gives you stuff, and there are loads of treasures to collect. All right, that's one. We're out of supplies. We get another debuff. Ooh, he's going to be pretty bad here, but I think we can just use his speech effects. So we're going to go to the longship and do the final boss fight. And then I can show you the game screen on the world map and how you upgrade your party and make decisions there. All right, let's see. Okay, so we've got a bunch of thugs here. Now, in, now in this case, it's going to reward me heavily for taking a friendly approach because I'm actually going to gain an item if I do that. If I do this aggressively, I actually gain a negative outcome or deviously, it's kind of middle road. So this actually works out pretty well for me because I have a lot of good friendly abilities. So first things first, we have an AoE right here we can use. My armor's pretty low. I'm a bit worried about that. So I want to take these bruisers out. And I believe they're actually weak to what I'm about to do. You'll notice that they are weak to excitement. So if I use the Peace Treaty, then that will be great. And that's also going to push the mood to friendly in a big way. All right, let's do that. Aha! And they run off. Awesome. Physical attacks now have 50% attack power. I believe that's for me only. I don't think that's for them. 
All right, so what can we do over here? Well, we can maintain range. Maybe just take this guy out and I think run away from these guys for the moment. Take him out at range. Weird. I, I must have misread this. Yeah, it's actually just a heal by the looks of it. Okay, that was a bit of a mistake because he's not going to be able to do anything now. I mean, I can excite him if I wish. I don't really see a reason why not. Make him excited. There we go. So his speech power is going to be better. And last but by no, no means least, we can move her out of the way. I don't think we have too many AoE possibilities, but we can get rid of him. So let's take him out. Cool. Unfortunately, that has changed the mood to aggressive almost immediately because, as you notice, sometimes, depending on the setup, it can be easier to shift the mood in one direction than the other. So we're going to have to move quite a lot more of that. But we do get speech defense, which is actually good here because the this enemy is going to use a lot of speech. Obviously, the physical attacks are going to suck a little bit. We're going to get... Oh, he's using speech too. Okay, that's fine. So that actually worked out in my favor. Now I want to be doing a bunch of friendly stuff, if it's all possible. Shame I don't have access to that AoE now, but never mind. I mean, you can see the possibilities here, right? You can see just how in-depth this is. Obviously, you probably want to turn those animations off after a while for fairly obvious reasons, but it's surprisingly in-depth. Surprisingly so. I want to move out of the way here. And let's get him to go away. Thank you very much. Just want to get rid of these henchmen for the most part. He's weak about that, so that goes. He's going to get hit pretty hard, I imagine, but his speech defense is still okay, so I'm not too worried. Hmm, I don't know if Encourage is going to wipe him out. Looks like it will. There we go. It's such an interesting idea for a combat system. I absolutely adore it. I think it's great. Really, really cool. And as I've said many times with rogue light games, one of the biggest issues that I've got with them is often their combat system being simplistic. But there are exceptions to that. FTL is a great example, and this is a lot like FTL. It really is. All right, let's see what else we get. Oh, big AoE coming out, and that's nasty. We might get to show you what happens when someone gets knocked out here. Basically, once they get knocked out, they lose resolve, and you lose one resolve point. And you can revive them, but it takes the turn of one of your other characters. So we might lose her, or we could just go all in on this. So she's weak to excitement, so we should probably just throw excite at her and hopefully try and beat her that way. And we fumbled it. Yeah, that sucks. That's really not good. Don't like that at all. I want to put him there so that he takes the hits. I'm hoping that they don't turn around and go for her. But I have a feeling that this boss might. So She's now confident, which is not good for me. But I think I can change that. All right. Alternatively, I can try and heal one of my friends here. Which might not be the worst idea. I don't think I can finish her off because I can't get in range. So let's heal. There we go. And that's going to be a big heal there. Cool. And hopefully we can finish this off next turn. And then I can show you how the world map progression works. This is really quite cool. There's actually a lot of options there. He's now impressed, which makes him weak to speech. Want to watch out for that. So you might take a bit of a hit here. Oh, he, he didn't die. All right. We can finish this, I think, now. Close. Very close. All right. Let's move in. Go for the excitable attack. She might finish her off. And it does. Cool. And that wins us the fight. Usually beating a boss will win the fight completely. And there we go. We've beaten the starter expedition. And that gives us a diplomatic approach, which is going to give us a treasure map, which means more stuff. Always good. The treasure is buried deep underground. You can pick one of those. It depends on what treasure you get. And I get a Viking shield, which means that my level two athletes gain plus five armor. And I get three campaign tokens. And that is the end of that short expedition. There we go. Explored the Highlands, which is always where you start, I believe. And this is going to tell you what your attitude was. And it's going to tell you the treasures you got and all of the resources you got. And this usually takes quite a long time, so I'm going to skip to through here. So as you can see, quite the haul here. Lots of campaign tokens. So that means a lot of status. Okay, so we can do quite a lot with that. And this is the leaderboard that I'm trying to win on here. Okay, and welcome to the Guild of Renowned Explorers. You now get your world map and you get a little upgrade which gives you a few extra supplies because of course all the other expeditions are a lot larger than this. Tells you what you need to do here. Yep, we get that. And here we go. This is the world map. So these locations right here are all things that you can go to in order to gain more tokens and buy new stuff. So at the end of every expedition, you get insight. Insight is what you get from making big finds and collecting treasures, and you can spend that to buff something you're missing. So right now, my research is awful. I've got almost none of it. So maybe I want to spend some insight in Berlin University to buff that up. And I do have a, a decent enough scientist. Not gaining a huge amount from that. 
but we gained a little bit and it's going to let me unlock one of my research trees. So these all give you bonuses. If you get to the end of every tree, you get a big bonus from that too. That's always great. So what do we want to go for? Well, uh, you start off by only having access to this. You need to complete two expeditions to get access to the rest of it. Do I want to go for Chronicles? I'm going to go for Chronicles. There we go. And I don't have enough research quite yet to unlock the first thing, but I can get it. So if we head back to close, we go back to Berlin and spend, we're going to spend our other two insight tokens on research, which will let us get that first unlock, which is quite important at higher difficulty levels. All right, there we go. Head over to research and we grab strong resolve. Cool. So there we go. All right, so that's all our inside tokens spent, but what else have we got? We've got other currencies. We have gold and we have status. So we have a lot of status this time around. That's going to maybe benefit us quite a bit. So status is primarily spent on your entourage. Now your entourage, you can hire specialists and helpers to buff different things. So if I want more research, I can hire some students. So every one of my study tokens that I gather, I gain extra research. Lobbyists give me more status. And this gives me more gold from collect tokens. Alternatively, maybe there's some good specials here. Ah, so I'm more of a friendly group, so I probably want to get one of these guys. So maybe we commit, maybe our game strategy is going to be committing to gathering maximum campaign tokens. So let's hire this fellow, who's going to give us an extra campaign token if I resolve an encounter friendly. Cool. You can also use this to upgrade buildings. So if I go to the shop here, and you gain access to various stores, depending on what you do throughout the game, it'll show you what you can get here. So here's your gear. You've got three slots per person, and they can equip a trinket, an offensive item, and a defensive item. Is there anything good here? Well, all of your basic stuff is awful. Do I want to get any of this? Mm, the, these are kind of rubbishy trinkets, I would say, but the defensive buffs you can get here are really, really good. So let's spend some money. I'm going to sell this rusty ring here, and I'm going to buy a decent memento. I'm going to sell the other rusty ring and also do that. Cool. So we're upgrading our defense, and I could also sell this le leather vest and get some decent armor. Usually best to go for defense early, I tend to find. I could upgrade the shop if I wish, but I'm not going to do that for the time being. We've still got some more status to spend, so let's get some more entourage. We could get all of this. Let's uh, let's buy an upgrade, because there may be a... Depends. So, sometimes the level 2 specialists are very cheap. Sometimes they're not. You really don't know until you upgrade the shop. So next time, I might be able to get a level 2 specialist. As it stands, we're getting helpers. So if I want to get more status, then let's hire a journalist. And let's hire some lobbyists. There we go. So that's really cool. That means I'm going to really gain a lot of fame. Okay, so I've spent all my resources. So I can check out all sorts of stuff read the newspaper, find out where I am, inspect my treasures and see what buffs I get. And then you get to choose an expedition. My guys are geared up and ready to go. I have access to the Caribbean Island, the Mali Mystery, which is a recent piece of free DLC they added, and the Hungarian Fort. Might go to the Mali Mystery, actually, because it recommends a friendly approach here. And it's going to give you a bit of an idea of what kind of challenges you're going to face. So maybe you don't want to go to a place that's hyper-aggressive. I've got a lot of challenges that you can't deal with. So let's go to the Mali Mystery. And this is your next expedition. And that is how the game plays out. You do five expeditions total, and then it scores you at the end. And of course, there are various events and all sorts of things that you will see. And they kind of randomize these areas with different challenges and things that you can find. So let's uh, go for a wits challenge to start with. Hopefully that won't be a mistake. Ah, a joke festival. Okay, it looks like Kwame might be pretty good at that. So Kwame can try and tell the best joke. You can get ways to affect this wheel. Go, 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 yes. You know, there's a, something that I always really like is when they put a little bit of attention to detail into this sort of thing. The spinner. Think about the spinner. Like, they could very easily have just had an instant success or fail. They could have a dice roll. But why is a spinner cool? Why does a spinner add tension? The reason a spinner adds tension is because it spins quickly and then slows down, and there's always that potential for it to slightly tick over at the end. And that is that nice little thrilling moment. That's that wheel of fortune moment. That's a deliberate design choice. That wasn't put in randomly. They realized that that's a great way of adding those exciting moments to the game. What a cool idea. And we succeed. Cool, we get a treasure hunt token. And a campaign token. We like those campaign tokens, don't we? Absolutely. All right, let's head in here. See what we can get. There is a hut. Okay. Hmm. Uh, we can give it a shot. The hut might collapse, but we have bonus resolve from our research. So it's worth taking this risk, I think. Ah, uh, don't take over. There's, there's the moment swinging in the other direction. I may or may not have destroyed their house. I am very sorry. Uh, let's find an encounter. Okay, I think you get the idea. We must fight them. 
and we can't pay the toll. Absolutely not. This game is awesome. Absolutely fantastic. I like it for a variety of different reasons. I love tactical turn-based combat, and this game does it in a really great way. Let's open up with a peace treaty here, because we're going to get tons of bonuses for finishing this encounter in a friendly way. What a great idea. What a nice little contrivance to take mood as a notion and actually theme the mood in a real way, you know? Excited characters gain extra speech power. Terrified characters, they gain extra attack, but that only kicks in if their overall mood is negative. So you have to control the battlefield and you have to keep an eye on their mood levels and also the overall battlefield mood. And of course, what your players are actually any good at. There's so much depth here. And yet, it's so elegantly presented in a way that's really simple to learn, but hard to master. It's a really awesome, unique system that I absolutely adore. And not to mention the fact the game looks great, it's got really colourful characters, a wide variety, a diverse collection of interesting characters that also interact with each other, by the way. There's a kind of clumsy character who is constantly getting into trouble, and that will trigger arguments and trigger cool little story fluff. So it does... It's not a case of just picking characters based on their abilities, it's also based on their personality, because you can get a different experience from that. I love that attention to detail, that's so wonderful. The game is hella challenging, especially on the higher difficulty levels. Very, very tricky. So if you like the difficulty level of FTL, that's good. And I think it's, it, it's honestly less random than FTL. I think it really is. It's very hard to get into a position where you can completely lose due to no fault of your own. Obviously, there's gonna be some luck involved in it. Yeah, you can have a screwy run, but you can avoid a lot of this stuff, and you kind of know what you're about to face when you go into combat. You don't randomly face enemies that hard counter you. You should know what they're good at, even based on just reading the flavor text before the encounter itself. It will tell you, are these friendly, are they devious, are they aggressive? It'll give you that kind of idea, and it'll give you opportunities to avoid combat. <clears throat> but of course you don't want to do that because you gain a lot of bonuses from going into combat in the first place. Speaking of lots of bonuses, look at that. Look at all that stuff I got. Collect tokens, campaign tokens, just all over the place. Special prizes, wonderful. This game to me is an overlooked gem. It hasn't got a lot of attention. Maybe it's just down to the name and the theme. I think the theme kind of puts people off. They don't really know exactly what it is. It's a wonderful... I guess, kind of Phileas Fogg around the world in 80 days themed sort of game. And I like that a lot. <laughs> Achievement says very roguelike. Okay, cute. Looks like there may be something going on over there. So we should head in that direction if we can. It's going to burn some supplies to do it. It's a wonderfully themed game. It is unfamiliar territory, I think, to a lot of people. But don't let that put you off. It's a unique theme. It's not a theme that's used all that much. It's a very whimsical kind of exploration. This idea that the whole world is open for discovery and there are wonderful treasures and surprises to be found. And everybody has a very excited and wistful attitude about that. It's a very positive game. There's some dark moments, absolutely. But they're dark in a kind of comedic fashion. I'm going to give this a shot. And there's so much variety and so much combat depth. And so much replayability. I, if I had one complaint about it, it would be the soundtrack not being all that inspiring. That's really one of the only complaints that I can come up with. I'm trying. I really am genuinely trying to come up with others. You know, maybe there are not enough locations. Sure, that's fine. They're adding more in. Marley Mystery is the newest one, of course. And I'd love to see more locations brought in in DLC because, of course, that really helps the replayability. But there's otherwise a ton of variety, even with the limited locations, because you come across different encounters every time, and there are different ways to approach the boss fights, the different gear that you might have, different overall goals that you may have. This is an interesting situation. That's very Disney, I love that. If I take a friendly approach here, I'm actually going to get a pretty serious debuff. But you know what? I'm willing to take that risk. For friendliness and confidence, and overall world positivity. There we go. The hyena was- I love the look of that! Someone put a lot of effort into that! I got a bunch of minus armor here, which will suck, but never mind, we'll make this work. This is- Why is this overlooked? Can someone explain to me? I- Maybe it just- I don't think it was marketed well, it just didn't really get a lot of attention, I suppose. This game is fantastic! 
It's genuinely great. Like, it's one of my favorite games this year so far. It's got so much going for it, so much depth, so much character, so much replayability, great systems, unique concepts in combat, awesome presentation. It There's so few faults with this to me, as far as I'm concerned. So few. I just love it. And if you liked FTL... And if you like a game that's a bit choose-your-own-adventure, a bit roguelike, and a bit tactical turn-based combat, you should absolutely be looking at Renowned Explorers. This is phenomenal. I've been playing this over and over again since I picked it up, and I'm kicking myself for not finding it sooner. You know, this game's been out for more than a month, and I heard very little buzz about it, and I eventually got around to playing it, and I said to myself, why the hell didn't I play this sooner than I did? This game is awesome. Just brilliant, phenomenal work from Abbey Games. So let me give it the strongest recommendation I absolutely can. Now, if you've liked what you saw here and you enjoyed the experiences of the games that I listed, Renowned Explorers is maybe better than those. Now, it's hot. I think, you know, in some ways it really is better than FTL. It's a lot, it's more fair than FTL. You know, the combat is very different. It's hard to compare that. There's a lot of tension, a lot of cool micromanagement to be found in FTL. And of course, the space theme is really, really cool as well. But the theme of this is great too. And it has different strengths. And it's taken the same sort of idea, giving you that wonderful variety and choose your own adventure and a different, different experience every time. But tried to keep it as fair as possible while still remaining challenging. And that is very difficult to do. And I think that they should be absolutely applauded for that. There's an epic boss fight over there, by the way. Yes, those exist too. Oh my. So much. So much content. So many things to do and explore and find. Renowned explorers, ladies and gentlemen. Available for the low, low, get it the hell now, what the hell are you doing price of $20 or your original equivalent. Sounds like a pretty damn good deal to me. I love it. It's awesome. One of my favorite games of the year so far. Ladies and gentlemen, renowned explorers, International Society, available on Steam and GOG for $20 or your regional equivalent. My name has been Total Biscuit. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.